Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian. I am the co-host and producer of the Base Pairs podcast here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. I should say the award-winning Base Pairs podcast now. <laughs> Tonight, I'm really excited to be introducing you to Tatiana Engel. She's one of our newer additions to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and she's the newest addition to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory's Swartz Center for Commut Computational Neuroscience. That's a mouthful. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that she earned her doctorate in physics, not neuroscience, at Humboldt University in Germany, where she became intrigued by neuroscience's almost kind of desperate need for complex computational problem solving, and should go a little bit into why that is the case. And uh, these days she's working on a new way to analyze large-scale neural recordings in which signals from many neurons, and we're talking not just like a couple, we're talking a lot, a lot of neurons, all at once throughout the brain are collected as animals performing varying tasks. So when an animal is doing a task, they're recording all those neurons signaling at once. And Tatiana's going to talk a little bit more about that and a lot of other interesting things. So thanks for coming. Facebook Live, thank you for tuning in and appreciate your patience. Uh, let's get started. I'm going to get a drink. <laughs> And today, I will talk about math and your brain. I see many people there, and maybe some of you came here in a hope that I will tell you how you can get better at math. But this is not what I will talk about. I am a computational neuroscientist. This means I am using mathematics to understand how brain does mathematics. And by this, I do not mean how brain solve equations. By this, I mean the kind of mathematics which helps you to navigate your everyday life. Meaning, move around the bar, grab a glass of beer, and drink it, actually, to reach your mouth with a glass of beer. You may think, wait, is that silly? I don't need math for that. But actually, our brains evolve so that we can move. Movement is not a simple thing. Think about an engineer building a robot. And now this robot is supposed to do what you're doing currently, just reach for a glass, grab it, and move the glass to the mouse. This is a complicated mathematical problem. You need to monitor torque in the joints of a robot. And you need to apply forces to the model of the robot so it's not missing the glass, and when it's grasping, it's not cracking the glass. <laughs> to do this, engineers use complicated equations, and this field is called control theory. It's a complicated, mathematically heavy field. However, our brain is able to do the same task with so little effort you don't realize all these control equations are currently solved in your head. How does brain can accomplish this? But even motor control may be one example. Another example is vision. You can see me now. You can see your neighbor. You recognize their face. You recognize the chair. You rec recognize a glass of beer. You don't even realize all this happening. But think about it that if you take an image with a camera and you need to say what is in that image. Is it a dog or a cat? If you think just about the problem of recognizing a dog, dogs can come in so many different shapes, sizes, colors, orientations, and can be hidden behind the blanket. If you look in the pattern of pixels on your camera, you can now realize that to realize there is a dog in the picture is totally not a trivial mathematical problem. And engineers have been busy solving this problem, the computer vision problem, to make a computer be able to see, which means to recognize images. So uh, engineers were busy with this problem 
for the last 50 years, and they still were not, until recently, they were not able to reach human level of performance, although they use complicated maps. So it seems to be able to move, to be able to see, brain is using a lot of calculations. How do scientists go about to figure out what algorithm brain is running? This algorithm is very powerful. How is one way to know um, or to get insight into brain algorithms is to trick the brain. If we know the algorithm, we know when it's going to fail or where it's going to do what it is not supposed to do. And you may experience it yourself by virtue of seeing visual illusions. I will give you now one example. Look at the image on the screen. It's a very simple image. It consists of gray lines and black dots. Wherever you look, there is a black dot. But at the side, at your periphery, you don't see any dots. So all of you look at different places in the image right now. So I'm not tricking you. I'm not putting dots somehow magically wherever you look. The image is a perfect static image. It's just an illusion that the dots disappear in parts of the image where you don't look. And this happens because your acuity, your ability to see, is very high at the place where you look, which is called phobia, but it's very low in the visual periphery. Because you cannot see very well in the periphery, brain, by using its computation, just try to do a best guess. It tries to feel in the places where you don't see so well. And because most of the space is occupied by lines, the best guess the brain is making in this case is just lines, no dots. So this is how easily the algorithm which brain is using can be tricked. But also, in case of brain disease, the patients can experience very strange things happening to them because the algorithm will be broken. I will give you two examples from, uh, from a neurologist and writer called Oliver Sachs who was a professor at NYU. Maybe some of you read his books where he described experiences of patients who suffered uh, brain problems. Uh, actually, he himself uh, suffered from very rare eye cancer called ocular melanoma, which led to loss of part of his retina. And as a result, his photoreceptors were damaged. So he literally got no light in part of his visual field, in one of his eyes. So what he would normally see in that part of the visual field would, would be just a black area, massive. However, he also observed that if he would focus his gaze on something steady, for example, on a white ceiling, all of a sudden, the black spot would be filled in and disappear. He would not see it anymore. This was an example where the brain was able to fill in the missing part of the image by doing its usual algorithm. Even more so, like if he would look at a brick wall where there is a predictable pattern of bricks, he would be able to see the brick wall throughout. Another example I would like to give you is about um, a Canadian writer uh, called uh, Howard Engel, who one day woke up, went to his porch to grab his daily newspaper, and when he opened the newspaper, he realized he cannot read it. It was his usual daily newspaper. He knew the language, it was English presumably, but he could not make any sense of any single character written in that paper. As it turned out, during the night he suffered a stroke, and the part of his visual cortex, part of the brain responsible for reading, was damaged. He could see, he could recognize faces, he could see his environment, but he could not read anymore. So the algorithm for recognition of visual characters was broken. So how is the brain actually able to implement this algorithm? Because it consists of cells called neurons. Well, neurons are connected to each other and they communicate to each other, but
But if the brain needs to do calculations, how do neurons do calculations? It turns out that every single neuron is very simple. It can do only very simple mathematical operations. The neuron can gather inputs from its neighbors. So it can add those inputs. It can do addition. And if this input is larger than some threshold, it can generate an output and pass it along to its targets. So all it can do, in a simplified form, is to get the information and pass it along. But now those neurons are wired in a very big network. And it turns out that by adjusting strengths of connections in this network, you can implement very complicated mathematical functions which will allow you to recognize objects or to generate complicated movements. It turned out that engineers picked up this idea and created algorithms called neural networks, which consist of simple units mimicking behavior of neurons wired in a large network. And when engineers built a large network of these artificial neurons, they were able to achieve very recently human-level performance on visual recognition task. And not only on visual recognition task, but also on speech recognition tasks. If you have an iPhone in your pocket now, maybe sometimes you talk to Siri. And Siri can understand what you're saying, and it can respond back to you. Can you guess what kind of algorithm Siri is using? It is a trained neural network, which was trained using the data of users so actually, when you speak to Siri, your responses are recorded and sent back to Apple so they are able to train this network to perform even better. So, as you see, the algorithms of the brain can not only be used to understand human disease, but they can also be used to develop a better technology which can interact with humans using human language and using human way to interact with each other. However, not everything is solved. There are still many challenges. For example, the algorithms which are currently used to train artificial neural networks are nowhere close to biological reality. And what actually happens in the brain, how brain can find the right structure of this network <coughs> to be able to accomplish this computation is still unknown. Um, and also, motor control still remains a very challenging problem. State-of-the-art robots still have troubles doing simple tasks like screwing a cup on a bottle, which you don't even think about. And therefore, we are still working, trying to figure out how brain do the calculations, and trying to see if we can use it to design intelligent machines. Thanks. Great. Uh, we're going to open this up to a Q&A now, so if anybody has questions, I guess I'll run around and you can either, uh, I'll point at you and you can start shouting or I'll hand you the mic. So, does anybody have questions? I heard it, yeah, I do already. All right. I know this is out of left field, but um, I recently discovered something called uh, cellular automata. You know that? Uh, how is that inter- facing with your research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they use cellular tomatoes, from my, my understanding, to uh, figure out communities of, of um, relationships. Each cell has a relationship to the neighborhoods around them and the neighborhoods around them. Is that anything that you're involved with right now? Right, so cellular automata was one of the models developed by physicists some time ago when they try to understand emergent phenomena. Which is a, so brain is just one example of this emergent phenomena, where we can take simple components, put them together, and the whole becomes more than parts. So cellular automata were first models which were developed in this direction, where you can take simple ingredients, very simple rules, very simple rules how these simple components interact, and all of a sudden, you can see complicated patterns of activity in large collections of the simple elements. 
So this theory of complexity or how this complex behavior emerges from simple components is something very important for understanding the brain function. The brain is just one example of such a complex system, maybe the most complex system we know of. And, and these are only models, only models. <coughs> the brain is not a computer, I understand that. But these are, these are only models, but they, but they give us ideas about how the brain works and what are the physical principles which allow the complex behavior to emerge from simple components. Thank you. So, Tatiana, like, what do you, how do you do this? Like, what, what does your normal day look like when you're trying to figure out these problems and these algorithms, like I don't get how that happens. Mm -hmm. So what I actually do, so I myself specifically, I'm working on the level of networks of neurons, trying to understand how those networks create emergent behavior and how those networks actually wired in real brains. And to this end, I collaborate with experimental neuroscientists who do experiments with animals. So as Brian mentioned, they train animals to do very interesting behavior where animals have to make decisions or recognize objects or pay attention. And while animals are engaged in this behavior, they're able to report activity from many neurons in animals' brain. And what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to make sense of these responses. Because if you've got a collection of thousands of neurons firing their so the signals which neurons send to each other hold spikes. How do you make sense of this large data? What does it mean? How can I read the decision of the animal in something which is just a collection of pulses over time? So I developed algorithms which can interpret this activity and based on what we learn about the activity, make guesses or predictions about how the network is wired to generate. Right. All right, cool. I'll come to around to the back, so I won't see some questions. Right, right, right. Yep. I'm wondering what happens to the brain when you have a somatic symptom disorder or conversion disorder that's momentary that can be visual. What actually is happening in the brain? So honestly, I'm not a neurologist, so I'm not even sure what this disorder is, and I guess I cannot address it properly. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, as a corollary to the other gentleman's questions, the, uh, the book by Wolfram, which listed out the study of the model, how many of those, and of course they deduce, how many of them actually apply to the brain? Uh, so, um, I guess, let me then maybe speak about the difference between cellular automata and the brain. Cellular automata, in, in like the original sensations, they don't have a goal. right? So there are simple rules, and you see something complex happening, but there is no a goal. Usually in neuroscience, where they have a neural network, it has a task, it has objective, right? Because this, uh, these are the constraints which are put on the brain by evolution, and this is how brains evolve, right? You need to recognize objects, this is your task. So now we want to design a system which is not just complex and showing something interesting, but which solves a specific task. Yeah. Tatiana, do you, do you focus on a particular area of the brain for looking at these spikes and, you know, all this stuff? Or do you specialize in any particular area, brain area? Yeah, that's a very good question. I guess, until very recently, people could record only a very small number of neurons, and they had to specialize and focus on particular brain areas. And I'm talking about experimentalists, right? So they would be able mostly to record, let's say, from visual cortex and study one area in the visual cortex very well, or focus on prefrontal cortex and study this area very well. But recently, the technology changed, and now what happens? People are able to record from many areas simultaneously. It seems fine, we're just getting data at a faster pace, but it turns out, no. Now the picture which is emerging is that those brain areas are actually talking to each other. And maybe it is a simplification, say, that you see with your visual cortex, and you hear with your auditory cortex, and you think with your prefrontal cortex. 
that all these areas are actually constantly talking to each other and communicating with each other to do even very simple tasks. So now it's not a surprise to anyone to say, oh, I reported activity in visual cortex, but I see responses to sounds. Because we actually integrate all our senses in our perception. Right? So I guess where neuroscience is going now is to understand what are the communication patterns between areas. How is the brain is organized on the global scale? So these are the questions which we currently try to address. Thank you. How, how are the recordings made? Uh, just the EEG or there are other techniques? There are multiple ways to record neural activity. So people record EEG, which gives you the coarse picture of neural activity. You can use functional MRI imaging, which gives you not direct measure, but also coarse measure of neural activity. But there are also other techniques to record activity more precise with cellular resolution, with the resolution of single areas. You can use electrodes, which are implanted in the brain, and you can also use optical techniques. So because there are technologies now which can visualize activity of neurons. For example, when neurons become electrically active, it starts to shine under the microscope. So in this way, people can also optically record activity of large groups of neurons. You have to open up the brain to do that. Right, so this research is only possible in animals. Yeah. However, even in human patients who suffer from epilepsy, for example, the surgeons have to implant electrodes to localize the part of the brain image which needs to be removed. And these people frequently volunteer their time to participate in experiments, and they do simple tasks. And during this task, surgeons, in collaboration with scientists, are able to record activity of neurons from human brain with cellular resolution. So, I got a question back here. All right, thank you. Should I be concerned, or are you concerned, about artificial neural networks advancing or scaling to the point where I become obsolete? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, in this case, we can all relocate to Mars, and some people actively working on this program, uh, if you know. Yeah, I guess all this progress which happens in near science and in artificial intelligence, you're absolutely right, is raising a lot of ethical concerns. And now, I guess, more than ever, the funding agencies fund not only the basic research, but also research about ethical consequences of what might come out of this research. It now becomes the norm. And these questions are difficult. They are hard. They are hard to predict what's going to happen. So you're saying I don't have to work? <laughs> no, I can say that. <laughs> I said maybe you don't need to worry for the next five years. <laughs> so I guess the current artificial intelligence system is still very, very rudimentary, right? So they maybe can recognize images, but they cannot make any meaningful decisions. When you talk to Siri, she gives Siri answers most of the time. So. Yeah, I guess you should not be seriously worried by now, but I guess on a long-term perspective, when we now realize the potential of this research, it's something to think about. Has the progress of this research been correlated to the pace of human <coughs> child development? I mean, is there, you know, can we, is that where that five-year figure comes from? <laughs> No, it was <laughs> but, but you know that Elon Musk now has a startup called Neuralink, who seriously plans to create brain-machine interfaces to enhance human capacity. I guess this is a response to the danger posed by artificial intelligence. If artificial intelligence is so smart or becomes so smart, we should also just become smarter. How can they be become smarter? Is to become cyborgs a little bit. To <laughs> open our brain with devices which will increase the broadband of our communication, maybe to have a creative consciousness in the cloud where you can just upload your thoughts or get the thoughts of other people. Right? So I guess the analogy here, at first when, let's say, brains develop, 
right? They allowed animals to move, but then the language developed. We started to communicate. We could tell each other. So we, as a group, as a society, we become smarter than an individual. Then we developed literacy. We developed written language. And we could pass this knowledge from one generation to the next. So now if you think, the next step would be to create a consciousness in the cloud. I guess it's a possibility. Uh, only the good stuff we have to pass. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question here in the back. Um, can you tell me where you think your ultimate research will have the greatest impact? So I think the, the directions which I think are very important is first to understand human brain and disorders associated with human brain. And these are hard to understand without knowing the basic mechanisms, right? For example, if you think about your ability to make a decision, to make a simple choice, this ability is damaged or it, it is altered in many diseases. But unless we know how the network is wired to make decisions, what are the ingredients to this network, and what specifically is broken, we will not be able to fix it in any way. So I'm sorry to say that, but currently, the drug development for mental illness is completely ad hoc process. So the doctors say this substance is not going to kill you. Let's try if it's going to relieve the symptom. Oh, if it relieves a symptom, it can become a prescription <coughs> drug. Because the mechanism which underlies the mental disorder are very poorly understood. And this is the biggest, uh, I guess, impact which this research can have, is actually they go down to the root of the problem. But the problem is complicated because it involves everything from the molecular mechanisms of how these cells communicate to the computational mechanisms on the very large scale of big networks. It spans a huge range of disciplines in a one big problem. It's a challenging problem, but I guess it can have very strong consequences for society. Do you have any um, input on someone who has like very bad bipolar or affective disorder, depression, and they're doing ECT treatments? Is that in response to try to break some of these connections, or I mean, I know you're not a neurologist, but yeah. you had any thoughts on that. So, honestly, I don't know what underlies bipolar disorder, so I, I rather skip this question, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, as far as Alzheimer's goes, is there different parts of the brain that you've looked at and where the neurons are affected in it? Or is, there, is it like isolated in one part of the brain, or do you not? Honestly, I'm, I don't feel confident enough, enough to answer about this. Okay. Tatiana, what's the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? Oh, okay. I don't know. I guess. Okay, so machine learning is just a new name for a field of statistics which tries to find patterns in the data and make sense of this data. Yep. Artificial intelligence, I guess, has a different goal. It's supposed to create artificial intelligence. But now there is a lot of overlap. Because what people realize that to create intelligent systems, sometimes you just need to collect a lot of data and find a pattern in this data. So machine learning and artificial intelligence start to integrate with each other a lot recently. So, yeah, I guess maybe it's a general um, direction that first you have disciplines, but then boundaries of these disciplines start to disappear. Let's say I'm a physicist, but I work in biology. Like, how did that happen? Right? So I guess a little bit of this happening as well in computer science artificial intelligence. Thanks. And I got a question over here. Uh, two questions, maybe they're related, maybe not. Uh, are there activities that can keep the brain supple and wide, say jumping jacks for the brain, whatever? <laughs> uh, number two, and uh, do you have a view on the emergence?
emerging literature on the excessive exposure of social media and the impact. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good question. Yeah. So, to your first question, can you train your brain? No, can you just not? To give it feet. Can you get better in math by doing math? The answer is yes. And there is a research on that. And, for example, there is a scientific study who just um, measured the ability to make decisions, how quickly and how accurately you make, you make decisions, and they compare normal people with gamers, people who, have, who play computer games and they have to make decisions all the time and very quickly, and gamers were way better in making decisions. So actually there are whole companies now which are based on this principle, for example, a company, maybe I should not name names, <laughs> but there, there, there are, <laughs> because I don't know about what tribes and stuff, but there is a company which creates computer applications, you can go online, you play computer games, but they actually train your memory abilities, they train your attention span, and so on and so forth. So clearly, there is a lot of learning in the brain. Brain is all about connections. Learning shapes those connections. Doing tasks helps you shape those connections. So if your doctor tells you do this memory exercise every day to train your brain, they're not lying. So this is actually based on real research. And the second question was about... Social media. Social media. Social media. I don't know studies on that particular. <laughs> Facebook rotting our brains. <laughs> <laughs> I did not study that. <laughs> the thing you said before about Siri sending something back to Apple, is that like, and then Apple is improving? Is there something to that? Like, that is that what's learning? Is there something in Apple that's learning about our speech and what we ask? And then is that the machine learning? Or exactly. So this is exactly the uh, question which Walter asked that how now machine learning integrates with artificial intelligence. So it turns out, so I mentioned to you that you have these algorithms which have big neural networks, but you need to set up connections between neurons so that they're able to do the task to recognize speech. Mm. To be able to do this, you need a lot of data. Data meaning examples of speech. Okay. Example of speech spoken in a different voice, um, right. in a different um, totally. accent, let's say. Siri still has time to recognize my Russian accent, for whatever reasons. <laughs> Maybe not, not many Russians use Siri in English. Um, yeah, but if you provide this data, uh, which is transcribed, so Siri listens to your voice, and it knows what you said, because it needs to be transcribed, it needs to be labeled data, then you can train the network, meaning you can have set up connections that response is the correct one. Can you train it to be Russian, to have a Russian segment? It has so like presumably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you would use many Russian speakers speaking English to Siri, this will improve Siri's ability to understand Russian accents. Wow. That's the machine learning part, which leads to intelligence to somebody. I got another question in the back. Uh, how long have you been working at uh, Cold Spring Harbor and on this project? And can you share with us any insights of aha moments of something that now you're going to be following up on? Uh, oh, let me follow up on this. <laughs> I have been in Cold Spring Harbor only since a year. So before that, I've, I was doing a postdoctoral research at Stanford. And there we had an aha moment. So I was working also closely with experimentalists, and I was looking in data from the visual cortex. And what we realized is that it was very surprising finding. So we were looking in brains of animals who are very engaged, awake, active, and performing a task, and we realized that small parts of the brain show patterns of activity which look just like when you are asleep. So this was a very interesting observation, but I guess I will not go into details about it. Because <laughs> it made a longer story than this night. But this was one of the aha moments which we're currently following up upon because it has very important consequences for why this happens, how this activity is different between sleep and awake, and what role it has. Um, yeah. Maybe I should stop there. Was it a habit? I got a question over here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
I was just wondering, um, from all the data you collect, are you able to make any predictive patterns? And do you think um, in the future we're going to come up with actual equations that people can use to apply to perhaps other parts of the brain than just the ones that you're currently studying? Yeah, this is a, this is a hope that uh, things generalize. So until recently, as I said, like the best the best of the knowledge exists about how brain areas work in isolation. But we see a lot of similarities between brain areas. When, for example, brain is solving some task, right, or making a decision, you see similar patterns of activity across the whole brain. On one hand, you can think. Uh, maybe it's redundant, maybe not all these brain areas are involved, or maybe they are working together, right? So the, what we learn from one area to some extent generalizes to another area, but I guess we also look for new theories, for new hypotheses which go beyond one area at a time and try to look at larger scale communication. All right, we got time for two more questions. So we got one in the front. <laughs> When you talked about that study about the gamers, that they were able to make a faster decision, was there any input as to whether that was just an accurate decision, a well thought out decision? Because I think when you're making complex decisions, the fast decision is not always the preferred decision. So is it just a question of speed? Was anyone looking at the depth of that decision? Oh, you're absolutely right. Well, not all decisions are the same decisions. So what I was talking about are simple perceptual decisions, right? So, for example, if you see something important on, like, with your peripheral vision, how quickly you, quickly you respond to it, right? You, you need just to detect something very quickly and also distinguish whether it's the right or not thing to, to respond to, right? However, there are more complicated decisions which job to choose. And I guess gaming maybe not necessarily helps on this like long term life decisions. So you have to be right. Okay, got the last one right over here. Pressure's on. Pressure's on. Okay. <laughs> I assume you, you test on the live animals and they must be anxious. So their anxiety, does that, uh, the result of their anxiety, they alter the, the readings that you get? And how do you account for that? So, I didn't do experiments, so maybe I'm also not in a position to really explain well. Um, but my understanding is that animals, they live in the lab and they are accustomed to the situation. So they're not like constantly scared of them uh, being an experimental animal. They may be um, very well used to be in, in an environment where like, different stimuli are presented and they need to generate responses. So they, they're used to this situation, so I think, like, and they do it re repeatedly over days and months and years even, right? So I don't think that necessarily doing an experiment itself generates a strong anxiety factor in an animal, because the animals are usually accustomed to, a, to the situation, and they're also taken care of. So the people who I work with, like, they really care for their animals. And if the animal gets sick, they spend the night in the lab taking care for the animal, just as it was their child. Right? So, um, Do you feel that there's any anxiety that the animal goes through that might go through the readings that you have? I guess not. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, can, I, can, I, I can... I don't know, because you see, like, everything, is, like, everything which concerns animal research is very well regulated and overseen. Because I'm ex not experimentalist, I'm not trained to handle animals. I don't have even access to the areas where animal experiments are performed. And that's why I'm also not very confident answering your questions, because I'm not interfacing. The only information I have by talking to experimentalists who I work with, and I know how they care for their animals, but I guess I'm not there at the moment. So I, yeah. Okay. So thank you, Tatiana. Can we get a round of applause for her?